before I share my thoughts with you on Alice's adventures in Wonderland, I'm going to read from the wiki to give you just some general information about it. So the book is commonly called Alice in Wonderland. Uh, it was published in 1865 uh, in England, I guess. By, it's written by Lewis Carroll, which that's a uh, pseudonym. Nom de plume? It's a writing name. What do you... What? Yeah, yeah, nom de plume is the correct one. People use nom de guerre for writers, which is silly because that's the war name. Although, I don't know the full context of it, but literally it means war name or warrior's name as opposed to, like, pen name. So, it just seems strange to me. Uh, but anyway, uh, it deals with the young girls. So, yeah, so it's it's funny. It's interesting. It calls Lewis Carroll a mathematics don at Oxford University, which is true, but it doesn't uh, say anything about the fact that this is not his real name, just in the, the top of that, which I find kind of interesting. But whatever. It was written by Lewis Carroll. Um, and it details the story of a young girl named Alice who falls through a rabbit hole into a fantasy world of anthropomorph anthropomorphic creatures. It is seen as an example of the literary nonsense genre. The artist John Tenniel provided 42 wood engraved illustrations for the book. And what else is there to say about it? The cover from the first edition has her holding the pig baby. Or the baby pig. The baby. Ma the pig masquerading as a baby. That's kind of funny. Um, apparently, it, you know, it can also be classified as a portal fantasy because Alice does literally go through a portal uh, to end up in this fantasy world. And it's also uh, listed as literary nonsense. Macmillan is, I guess, the current publisher and it was followed by the sequel Through the Looking Glass. And actually, the uh, the source that I got it from, I, I listened to it from Cloud Library for free. Uh, and the audiobook version I have, it had like a two-hour introduction, which if you're really interested in the historicity of it and in the background of the book and learning more about you know Lewis Carroll, uh, then I would suggest that you go ahead and listen to that. But... There are rumors and whispers and little things you hear here and there about Alice in Wonderland. I heard stuff as a kid from uh, regarding the Disney animated version of it that it was trippy and possibly drug related. And this is a family friendly show, so I'm going to be touching on very sensitive topics, but I won't actually say anything outright unless you are against your children hearing that something is drug related. Uh, then, you know, sorry, but uh, that's, uh, I guess, we're still feeling each other out. So, uh, trust me, I, I'm doing my best, but I also don't want to have to dance around everything. But there's certain things regarding the the reality behind this book and the background behind this book that are odd or, you know, creepy criminal, whatever, that I won't really fully go into. Um, but, yes, the, the bio and the behind-the-scenes, the making of uh, peace in this book, book. I, I, I can't tell you which edition it was, except for it's the one that I found at Cloud Library, so good luck finding that one. Uh, it seems to uh, validate that there are odd, creepy, uncomfortable things in the author's real life uh, that uh, are attached to <laughs> the fact that this book was created at all, which is interesting. But that's very much off of the point, and I have stated previously that I have no interest in uh, canceling or attacking or denigrating anybody in uh, in this project of going through all these middle grade books. But I also, you know, I'm a person. I, <laughs> I, I foolishly listened to this entire thing and it colored, it sort of colored my perception of the book or my reception of it, but it didn't. Um, it made me feel like, honestly, learning about the background made me think, do I really want to read this? Uh, but I went ahead and, and read or, or listened to it anyway. And I thought, you know, I, Part of my ethos is I want to be able to divorce the artist from the art and uh, take the art and, and let it stand on its own. Because if I didn't know these things, and there are plenty of people who are, you know, ignorant of them, uh, you know, how would I judge this? And I have to say that, you know, whatever the uh, author did in his real life, um, it doesn't really change how I feel about the book other than it's just slightly creepy, and honestly, uh, it, it's turned me off of going into the next book. However, I think the content of this book itself uh, was enough to turn me off of going into the next book. So I won't go into the sequel, and there's even like a, a, a second sequel, uh, which is like an elegy for Ellis, which, for Alice, not Ellis, uh, which is even stranger and even weirder and makes things even more uncomfortable. But again, that's, uh, that's not really something I have to go into. So, uh, yeah. This book is weird. <laughs> it 
this book is really weird. It is called Nonsense. You know, it, you know, it very well may be the um, the seminal work of nonsense literature, and I agree with that. But it's interesting because uh, nonsense is kind of a serious business if you think about it. And the wiki mentions something about this, but it kind of helped to codify what I wanted to say. So I'm not reading from the wiki. I just I was inspired by something it said, which is that there is a talent and a trick and a structure to nonsense. Um, I feel like I've said this recently in one of my recordings, but uh, I don't think it's been for this uh, sub-series of Story Over Everything, so I'll go ahead and share it here, which is that writing, performing, and making comedy that works is difficult. And I, I mean, whether it's a comedic stage play, or it's a, a humorous book, or it's a stand-up comics routine, it is difficult to do or to make effective comedy because uh, even though it's lighthearted and funny, there is a craft and there is a structure and there is a way that things need to be done. And in fact, I heard a uh, <laughs> a songwriter uh, comedian uh, on a podcast who was talking about the fact that music has a tension and release cycle to it. And he says that comedy is the same way and that the thing with stand-up comedy is it's you have even less time and you even have less, you know, word count you can use to build up the tension, set up the scenario, and then have the release, uh, which is interesting because I can see that applying here. And I, could, I would say that while the incidents and the scenes or the set pieces or however you want to call them in Alice in Wonderland are uh, – like, I don't have much affection. Well, <laughs> it's funny. It, it's a really weird thing. Like, I, I kind of felt like I was captivated by this book and uh, kind of taken prisoner a little bit. And uh, it wasn't that bad of an experience. <laughs> um, but I, it's not something I, I really want to repeat. Like, let me put it this way. Lewis Carroll was obviously a brilliant man. And the structure and the intelligence at play in the absurd and nonsensical Alice in Wonderland are uh, remarkable. They deserve to be remarked upon because it's very well structured. It is very intelligent and it's all silly and nonsensical. There's a lot of wordplay. There's a lot of puns. There's a lot of like taking things and turning them over and exploring them from the other side or from the inside out or the outside in. And it's very interesting. And <laughs> like, I, I don't know, there's a very loose narrative, which is basically this spoilers. Uh, if you haven't read it <laughs> or seen the movie or anything like that, uh, Alice falls into the rabbit's hole. She goes from absurd scenario to absurd scenario where things are awkward and brusque people are brusque and violent and vulgar and uh sort of unhinged and they're all attacking her and it's weird there's this whole thing where alice is shrinking and growing and shrinking and growing and she references shrinking and growing in size at one point she equates it to shrinking and growing in age and at the end of the book at the climax alex Alice sort of grows up and becomes larger and defends herself. And at that point, she's able to free herself from whatever happened. And she wakes up effectively and uh, like runs into the house for dinner or tea or whatever it is. And you realize it was all sort of a dream, maybe, but maybe it wasn't. And who knows? Um, but it's absurd. And there's something weird about the fact that she grows to great size and then she realizes that all the troubles that had beset her were nothing. They were ephemera. They were nothing more than a, a dream or a, you know, a fancy. And that all she had to do was, like, get up and ignore them in order to move on with her life. And... That's true in one sense, but in another sense, that's not true because she doesn't really do that. But then again, she is such a young girl, eight, maybe ten at the most, that 
she doesn't have really an arc. There's no <laughs> there's no suggestion or notion that Alice is a flawed character. We see that she's flawed. Uh, we see that her way of viewing the world and others is not correct from an adult point of view. But the narrative really never gets into that. It never examines it. It never uh, puts Alice under a microscope and talks about her flaws, if there are any. Uh, <laughs> or at least it never occurs to her that she has real legitimate flaws. Like, there's there's some things that the narrative states, the story states, or Alice thinks about, and we get in on that, and she's totally wrong. But the story doesn't say that, and because it's so focused on her and her perception of herself and the world around her, she doesn't really see that she's incorrect about things, and... <laughs> and she kind of lets herself slide on certain things that she wouldn't necessarily let other people slide on. And it's it's a little unfair, and I'm not judging Alice harshly because she's a child, and it's written from this very childish perspective, um, which is interesting because that's kind of a complaint I had about Natalie Babbitt's... Uh, the way she told her story in Talk Everlasting, and that was the last book I, I read listened to, uh, last book I analyzed and thought about and chatted about, so it's, you know, most strongly on my mind right now, as I'm thinking about what Carol did with Alice, and it's strange, I'm, I'm more forgiving, <laughs> wow, this is strange, I'm more forgiving of what Carol did with Alice, uh, is in the book, as far as the story is concerned, uh, than I am with what Babbitt did with, uh, hmm, what's her name? Winnie, Winnie Foster. I'm more con, I'm more accepting of what he did with, with her than what Babbitt did with Foster, with Winnie, uh, because <sighs> while the characters in each scene and each scenario kind of do take themselves very seriously, uh, there is a playfulness and an impermanence and an unreality that is apparent in the absurdity of everything going on in this wonderland that Alice finds herself in that isn't true of Winnie's world. And the scenarios that she finds herself in in Tuck Everlasting. So, I, it's also unfair. They're, they're very different books. Um, and it feels a little unfair, honestly, to compare them to each other, but I think spending some time talking about them in conversation with each other does make sense. And not that they're literally in conversation with each other, but they're two pieces that I've talked about and experienced recently, and if you're following along with me, um, then there's something that, you know, there are two things that you've recently had an experience with, and there are things that can be talked about in each of them. Uh, you know, that do bear on each other or at least seem to reference each other, even though they are they were written, I don't know, a hundred years apart or so. And golly, I think that's interesting. And, and it's really interesting to me that, you know, taking a step backwards and looking at my process for doing this, uh, examination of, of uh, middle grade fiction, you know, broadly speaking, is that I have broadly, broadly, broadly broken up middle grade fiction or these, you know, stories for children that could qualify as middle grade fiction before that was a, a real category uh, in classic and modern. And uh, being from, I think it's 1875, Alice is classic. And being from 1975, uh, Tucker Everlasting would be considered modern. And yet I see similar problems with them. Uh, I see similar... <laughs> Similar craft and, and deafness and skill in the authors, uh, but I think they're definitely going for two different things, and wow. I don't know. I don't know how to finish that thought, so I'm not going to. If you have a, an idea of how to finish that thought, please let me know. C give me a comment to, uh, to help me out here to have this conversation because I'm just, I'm just not sure, and I don't, I'm restraining myself. I don't quite want to go as far as I could go because... Uh, I don't think it's useful or appropriate for the, the audience. And, and while I do not aim this show 
at a child audience, I do want it to be accessible to uh, children if they so desire, if their you know, parents or guardians want to let them in on it. On this, uh, dare I say, like higher level conversation on these books, because while, while these books are made for children, uh, they are not read exclusively by children, and they're made by adults for children, and therefore, while I think it is important to let the work stand on its own merits, um, it is important to also think about what the adults who wrote these books for children maybe had in mind, or maybe had to say uh, to these children. And while I think Tuck Everlasting did have things to say to children, uh, and it didn't speak down to children, which I think is a merit, and while maybe I didn't like what it had to say, or how it said it necessarily, uh, I think that Carol's book, has nothing to say to children, specifically, (laughs) which feels really weird. It's almost, I don't know, it's almost an exploration of the mind and or dreams of a child and, like, giving those life and uh, breathing some, breathing life into them and giving them structure and form so that they can be explored and played with. And maybe, maybe there's some sort of social commentary going on that I'm now uh, many years divorced from Victorian England. And if, what is it, 125? Is that what it is? Um, many, many years divorced from Victorian England. And I also don't come from a culture being in, you know, being born in the late 1980s in America, uh, Southern California area. Like, that's so foreign to me. Uh, that culture of you know, tea rooms and nurseries and, you know, all this propriety, uh, which I don't think is a bad thing, necessarily. Um, I think every era has its pluses and minuses. And my point is that I'm just so out of touch with the milieu where this was, you know, written that I don't really understand certain things. Certain things about it are universal, the way language is being played with, uh, and maybe it's because I'm, you know, <laughs> a self-taught writer type person, and I've I've consumed a lot of literature. Uh, perhaps because of that, some of the jokes and games of logic that Alice is engaged in or uh, trapped in, you could say, uh, they're more apparent to me uh, than maybe your average, uh, you know, eight-year-old today. I I kind of think Alice was supposed to be eight years old. Anyway, if you gave a modern eight-year-old this story, I don't know that they would appreciate it in the same way that I'm able to, and that an eight-year-old, you know, of Alice's time would have been able to because of the exposure to to certain concepts and ideas and manners of thinking. I feel like if I keep going, I'm going to just babble on. What's that you say? I've been babbling already? Oh, my apologies. (laughs) I didn't mean to babble, but here we are. Uh, Lest I babble on anymore and cause greater confusion, uh, I will try to wrap this up quickly by saying I think the book is very skillfully written. I think Lewis Carroll is a very intelligent man, and I think he applied his intelligence and his skill for uh, logic and uh, games very deftly here, and some aspects of it are enjoyable. In fact, the Mock Turtle song uh, is like, it, it was a joy to experience, especially in the audiobook version of it. And uh, it just, I, I don't know. There's something kind of magical about this, but it also felt like I was like, like, <laughs> it almost felt like I was, like I said earlier, like I was abducted. I was like taken for a ride and I didn't like it. Um, some parts of it were enjoyable, but some parts of it were very unenjoyable. And it was like, I, I, I can't wait for this section of the, book to be over for this chapter to end and go to the next one and see where it goes and, you know, is there a narrative here? I don't really know if there's a narrative here. Um, it's almost like each thing was a, a skit or an opportunity. It, like, each thing was its own self-contained unit which was created for a specific purpose that I don't quite understand what each specific purpose of it was because I was waiting for an overall 
narrative arc to happen and to unfold, and it didn't really. And there's, like, weird questions of identity, like, with the Caterpillar and stuff, and, like, certain things keep coming up about, you know, if you call, you know, a, a person or a thing or a place by a certain name, does that name matter? Does it have power? Does it change if you change the name? Or if you can twist the name and make a joke out of it, does it transform the thing into something else? And it sort of does, but it sort of doesn't. And it's a weird kind of postmodernist way of thinking, which I think there's a little utility. <laughs> That's almost a, a joke and a, a puzzle in, it's a, in and of itself. I think there's a little utility in postmodernist thinking, but I also think it's sort of toxic uh, because of where it leads. And yeah, I, I will restrain myself from saying much more, uh, but I didn't really, there were things that were enjoyable about the book, and there were things that I liked, but there were also areas where I was made so uncomfortable by the book and what was going on, and I don't really, uh, I don't really know. I, again, this is, uh, this is what I said last time. I don't know what the use is or what the purpose of this book was, and I don't know what benefit it was to me in reading it. I, I don't feel like I was enriched by reading this book at all, and I was entertained from time to time, but I was also befuddled and confused, and it's not a book I will read again, uh, and I do not plan on reading any of the sequels, and if any of my children were to ask me if they should read it, I would tell them, no, it's not really worth your time. If you want absurd writing, uh, or like absurd storytelling, I would suggest, just right off the bat, James and the Giant Peach, I've listened to my family read most of it, and uh, that seems much more beneficial <laughs> and much less uncomfortable and, like, overall a greater experience for an absurdist adventure. And I would even say, I think, did we read Charlie and the Truck Factory? I don't know. We're not, like, a big Roald Dahl family, but we're kind of, uh, I, I'm definitely interested in exploring more of his work, and uh, I know some of my kids are as well, just you know, at least a couple more things. Um, but I would definitely suggest, and, and I do plan on reading The Wonderful Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Baum. L. Frank Baum set out to write things, uh, to write his books to be just fun fairy stories that weren't moralistic and didn't have necessarily a message to say to children. Uh, and I don't know, off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you what the message of uh, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz is, other than maybe the thing you think you need to get for yourself is something that you've had all along. Um, that might be what it is, but it, I don't think it really is. I don't think it has much of a strong message, but it's definitely absurd and it's definitely charming. And uh, I've listened to all 14 Oz books and I'll tell you, they're absurd and charming throughout, but they don't make me uncomfortable like Carol's book does. Uh, they have a more structured narrative flow to them. They have an arc, um, some arc, they've, you know, even if it's just an adventure arc of exciting things happening to our friends and heroes uh, throughout the books, and the, if the characters don't change, which they don't really, uh, that's okay, because, you know, things change in the world, things happen in the world, there's a progression in Oz, and there's some linearity, to, there's enough of a linear uh, through line, or I don't know if I'm using that properly, there's enough of a forward momentum throughout all of the Oz books, and within each Oz book itself, that it makes the quest and the adventure feel meaningful and at least meaningful to the characters if it's not meaningful to me. It has at least a, a tangible meaning and uh, progression that benefits the characters from going through it versus I don't feel like that with this book at all. It, it feels like a pointless book. It feels like a pointless story because it doesn't really go anywhere and it doesn't end where it began in a circular way so that it feels homey and it feels like, uh, I don't know, like Alice went on an adventure and then gets to go home and is, you know, somewhat changed or whatever. Um, it doesn't feel like that to me. And I'm not saying 100% that all the Oz books have that feel, but at least tangibly the characters are physically in a different place than where they started, or at least some of them are, even if the hero, Dorothy, for example, returns uh, to, to Kansas in the beginning, or at the end of uh, her book, you know, not really changed. Um, but it's okay there because, I don't know, just something something between personal preference and, I think, like, objectively, what the books accomplish or what they do, uh, it's a real enough difference to make me... Re I'm rereading Oz books to my kids right now. 
obviously not while I'm talking to you, but I'm uh, I'm halfway through the series and I'm loving it, and uh, it's so wonderful. Whereas I I can't say the same thing for Alice. It's not something I'm going to want to experience again, really. And I just I don't know what makes a difference, but maybe you do. Maybe you do. Maybe you can tell me. I would love if you have uh, thoughts on this after hearing this to defend the book or to laud its merits. I would love to hear that. And uh, yeah, I I am curious to see what other people think about this book and to see where they come down on it because I'm I'm not against it. I don't hate it. I don't think it should be <laughs> – I don't know. Like I, I don't have – if, if you didn't listen to the last episode, I had a problem with, or I have a problem with Tuck Everlasting. I don't have that same problem with this book because it doesn't go in the same areas. Um, but I just wouldn't recommend it, and I don't understand how it's become a classic. Um, yeah, that's about all I have to say. So uh, I'm really curious to hear what people's feedback is on this and uh, to hear your thoughts on Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, and any of other uh, any other of Carol's writings, if you've read them and have thoughts and opinions and feelings on them you'd like to share. Okay, so I've thought about this a little bit, and I have an addendum. I don't understand how this story became a classic or is considered to be a classic. I shouldn't say the story, this book, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. I just don't understand that. So if you have an argument for that or reasons why it's classic, please tell me. I'd love to hear. I'd love to know what you think about it. Uh, second of all, I don't think there's an actual story here, which is – that's the crystallization of everything that I – or of most of everything that I said, and that's it. <laughs> to quote Elaine from Seinfeld, this is – anyway, um, it's like a big budget – movie that goes nowhere or <laughs> that's a paraphrase now uh yeah like there's all these blinking lights and there's smoke and there's uh hookahs and uh wine and tea and all sorts of stuff but like nothing is of consequence and i think then therefore it logically follows that there is no story and I don't know if you know this, but to me, story is the most important thing, uh, <laughs> uh, evidenced by the fact that this is a story over everything production you are listening to right now. So the lack of story repels me. There is no endearment strong enough. Nothing that I found cute or fun or funny or interesting in it is substantial enough to keep my attention or to let this take a place in my heart because there's no story there therefore it's meaningless to me and worthless to me but if you differ i'd love to hear why how and what the details are that what specific things you have to counter that sentiment that argument from me and if it's because you don't believe stories the most important thing that's okay but just then tell me what's what it's or what is, you know, so worthwhile in this without a story. I hope you enjoyed that. Subscribe to keep up with me. Like and share to help me reach more people like you. And go to mjmunoz.com to find your next favorite thing. And don't forget to let your voice be heard. Stories are always better when you're part of the conversation. Until next time, be well. This is MJ, signing out. This has been a Story Over Everything production.